to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Welcome again to the big picture. The fighting in Korea is over now, and the deeds of the American and South Korean soldiers who fought those battles are part of our military history. When the Reds attacked, the South Korean Army was a small band of ill-equipped and inadequately trained soldiers. But it later rose to become a large and modern fighting machine. Our story this week is the story of how that was done. This is Chang Shiyu, serial number 215658. He's a lieutenant in the Army of the Republic of Korea. Chang is a good officer, too. He's a leader, understanding the problems of his men, willing to do all that they can do and then some more. It was men like Chang who led and trained the gallant South Korean Army. This is the story of how Lieutenant Chang and the Rock Army grew into a great fighting machine. It is the story, too, of Han and Lee and Yun, the splendid fighting youth of Korea. Once only a few years ago, Chang and his countrymen were tillers of the soil. They grew rice and barley and wheat and soybeans and vegetables. Some were fishermen netting in vast catches of all varieties of fish to help feed the hungry mouths of Korea's millions and to export for the nation's economy. There was a time once when the life of Korean men was normal. They were teachers or city men performing city jobs. They were streetcar conductors. They were the everyman of Korea. But that was before the communists came and before Korea became a battlefield, before death and murder were a daily routine. In those early days, Chang and his friends had only bamboo sticks to train with, but they had the will to fight, even though they lacked the weapons. Though small in number and poorly equipped, the brave South Korean army fought for what it believed was right. Hopelessly outnumbered, they fell back, and the fair land that was Korea was devastated with ruin and destruction. And the people were assaulted and massacred and made homeless. But not for long were the defeats and the withdrawals. Three nations of the world took up arms against the red aggressors. Supplies and help rolled in. The people of South Korea took heart, and they fought back savagely, pushing the enemy back and back, until soon he was licking his wounds behind the line from which he had first unleashed his bloody dogs of war. They defeated him because they had learned that men of peace cannot defend themselves adequately against the evil designs of the men of war unless they are prepared with vast quantities of materiel of war, unless they are prepared with oil and gasoline to feed the mighty juggernauts with power, unless they are prepared with cargo trailers to haul the materiel, unless they are prepared with rations to feed the fighting men, and most important, unless they are prepared with ammunition to feed the fighting guns. But men must be trained in the dreadful arts of modern warfare. And the Army of Korea needed help in starting training programs for its inductees. The appeal for assistance was answered. That's why the United States organized KMAG, the military advisory group to the Army of the Republic of Korea, 
which was conceived for the avowed purpose of advising in the organization, training, operations, and support of the Korean Army commanders and staff officers. Just as the common men of the free world joined forces to fight the common foe, so did their leaders sit down together to plan a systematized training program for the Korean Army. Representing the Korean soldier was General Pike sun yup Acting for the United States and the United Nations was General Cornelius E. Ryan. The results of these conferences was the completion of a number of training centers, the principal one of which was RTC-1, the largest training installation in Korea. Its name, Jeju-do. For hundreds of young Korean men, it all began that eventful day when as the cream of Korea's youth, they were inducted into the Rock Army and together caught their first look at Jeju-do. Soon the LSTs on which they were being carried were nosing into the beach. A huge pile of rock overshadowed the island and seemed to symbolize the rock-like determination of Korea to win out. Yes, this was Jeju-do, activated February 6th, 1951 as a rock training center. Chang and his countrymen took a first look around the island that was to be their new home for the next eight weeks. They didn't know it then, but RTC-1 had a total training capacity of more than 70,000 men. At the time, they little realized that instead of being a disorderly bunch of raw recruits, they would soon be returning with the alertness and precision of trained soldiers. At their first formation, they learned a little of what was before them. What were their thoughts during the ever-changing events of that first day? Nobody knows, but all who were there knew that here in the shadow of Mount Masulpo, a new Korean army was being born. And then came orientation to their new place in life, their new duties, for they were soldiers now, not private citizens. And as soldiers, they were expected to obey the orders of their superior officers. Because so many of the inductees were young, inexperienced farm boys, it was necessary that such things be explained to them exactly, thoroughly, and patiently. Yes, a new life was beginning for the young men of Korea, and somewhere among this raw group, leaders had to be found. For the army was in dire need of competent leaders. The records of all the inductees were carefully examined to determine which could qualify. For many of Korea's new soldiers, the clothing and material issued was more than they'd ever owned in their past lives. KMAC realized that if men are to fight well, they must be supplied with at least the common necessities of life. One of those necessities is a buddy with whom to share confidence and fear. KMAG also knew that one of the most important necessities to a soldier is a warm, comfortable roof over his head. The first relaxation from the exhausting events of that first day brought a little time to think about the life they had just left. They thought about old Grandpa Kim, who refused to evacuate his farm near Seoul because he wasn't afraid of anything anymore. And about Aunt Wang, who had been bombed out of her house, so she found another home below ground. And what about their little cousins? What were they doing? How were they living under war conditions? And of course, there was Nam E, that trim little girl who was doing her bit as a nurse, working with the United Nations Civil Assistance for Korea. There was little relaxation after that. The time of the dreamer is in peace. The time for action is in war. At first they seemed one huge, awkward squad. But the constant drilling at the manual of arms helped to smooth it out a great deal. It was hard at first, but gradually by doing, they soon caught on.
And then there was more drilling and more marching, with no let-up, with no time to think about aching muscles. There was a war on, and they were made to realize that wars were not won by weaklings. Before they were aware of it, they began to sense that subtle feeling that comes with knowing that they were working together as a well-trained unit, with military precision and dispatch. But it wasn't all marching and drilling. Quite often, they were treated to the pleasure of sitting. But they had to be learning at the same time. And so they were taught the anatomy of a rifle. Taught that a rifle is not just a rifle. That it is made of many little intricate parts. They learned that a good soldier knows how to use his rifle best only when he knows what makes it tick. And stick. It was fire. Up to your feet again. Forward to the attack. Then came rifle practice, how to hold their rifle, how to squeeze on the trigger, not pull. They had already learned how a rifle operated. Now came instruction in what it could do, kill. In war, they were told it's kill or be killed. They also learned how to take care of others. One thing they learned, that it was not only important for a soldier to know how to kill, but he must be able to save lives as well, his own included. First aid is important on the battlefield. Another thing they learned, rifles were not the only means of destroying the enemy. Mines and booby traps not only delayed the advance of armies, but often stopped them permanently. So first the theory in class sessions, then practice in the field. A lot of practice. It was hard work digging those mine holes but they were made to realize that it was easier to dig a hole for a mine than to have one dug for them. If some thought that was hard work, they soon found out it was easy compared to the work they did when they went into combat training for the individual soldier. That's when they learned about using camouflage too. They fell to the ground, fired, then moved on, and crawled, and kept on crawling, with a heavy rifle cradled in their arms. They complained, but with grit and determination they carried on. They knew it was worth getting a few calluses on their elbows to be able to learn how to avoid getting a bullet in their head. It wasn't long before they also learned how big a bullet hole could be, especially when it came out of the business end of a Browning automatic rifle. Yes, the Korean trainees were impatient, impatient to learn fast, but with a little instruction, they soon got the hang of the most complicated weapons. When they squinted through the sights of that BAR rifle, they remembered that one day it would be the enemy. One thing they never got used to, the marching, 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 with a full pack waiting weary shoulders. But they stuck it out grimly, because they knew it was all part of the job of becoming a good soldier. They knew that this was toughening them up so they could meet the enemy. One way of making sure you go forward when the time comes is to know how to fire that M1 rifle, straight and true and to the mark. And they learned how to use all the weapons, including hand grenades. The bazookas were heavy, but they knew the rockets they delivered carried a terrific wallop. And always they were learning under the expert guidance of old Korea hands. Tough, determined men who had been through the early campaigns, who had come back to teach the inductees what they had learned through bitter experience. Every day was filled with something new. The field fortification instruction, for instance, with barbed wire. First, a demonstration. Then, do it yourself. In preliminary training, with that marvel of communications, the handy talkie, how to operate, what makes it work, what is it used for, all the questions are answered and the soldier's knowledge grows.
with a compass too, which led to training in map reading. And then there was all that instruction and practical work in the combat formation training. It may have seen then that they were playing kids games, but they were kids games that would pay off. If ever they were to find themselves in the middle of the real thing, they'd realize that all this intensive training was for their protection. After eight weeks of basic military training, Chang and his buddies were almost ready for battle, almost. For the question now was, how would he and the other trainees conduct themselves under actual battle conditions? Here's where those games they played came in handy. They were able to climb that hill without tiring too much because their climbing muscles had been toughened by all the marching they'd undergone. Korean and American officers were on hand always to observe the results of their training. The results of all the efforts K-Mag had exerted in turning out fighting rocks. They knew how to handle that bazooka because they had been taught patiently. The BAR weapon too. This was the result of all the hard and patient work that had gone into their training. This was what they meant by battle conditions, so that when the soldier was confronted with it in the future, he'd be prepared for it. And then, still under the watchful eyes of the KMAG advisors, the Korean trainees were put through the confidence course, discovering it was one thing to go through maneuvers without opposition, but it was quite different when live ammo was being thrown at you. This was the acid test. If they came through this, they were ready for anything the enemy could lob over at them. Cover and concealment training had taught them to roll over a wall instead of exposing themselves to enemy fire. And they kept on crawling as the shells burst around them. As the machine gun bullets spattered a murderous background to this baptism of fire, Chang kept on crawling because ahead of him was the opportunity to be a soldier in the army of the Republic of Korea. The first eight weeks of training were coming to an end for most of the others, but not for Chang, because he had been accepted as a candidate for officer's candidate school by the time his final inspection at Jeju-do came around. He remembered how stern that inspecting officer looked and how worried he was. And then how proud. This was the last time he'd march with his buddies at Jeju-do. For them, additional branch material training. For him, it was OCS. It seemed only a short time ago that they'd arrived at Jeju-do as untrained recruits. Now they marched back to the LSTs as soldiers ready for battle. Chang, happy and a bit proud, knew that although it was his last day as a trainee, it was soon going to be his first day in more advanced training. Before he realized it, he was marching again, this time with the other OCS candidates. Marching into his new home, KATC, the Korean Army Training Center at Kwanju, on the mainland of Korea, which housed the infantry, artillery, and signal schools of the Korean Army. Here he would specialize as an infantry officer. No wonder he experienced a glow of pride during the initial inspection 
dressed in a new uniform as an OCS candidate. The last phase of his training was beginning. Then it was back to attending classes. No time to waste now. Officers were desperately needed. They were taught the principles of military training, preparation, application, examination, discussion, and criticism. The teaching never stopped. Then began a period of learning from technical manuals. There were times when they would have preferred the marching, but they stuck to it because they knew they had to know theory as well as practice to be a good leader. There was practice too, lots of it. On the rifle range again, always with live ammo, so that firing an M1 rifle became almost as natural to them as breathing. The heavy stuff too. Theory first with the heavy machine guns, and then practice, lots of it, until you thought they would never get the chatter out of their ears. And then even heavier stuff, the 4.2 mortar. Yes, theory first, as always. And then, as always, more practice. They knew this wasn't officer's work. But they also knew that a good officer should be able to do anything his men can do, and more. There were calisthenics, too, to build up bodies so that they could withstand the rigors of that intense training. Body push-ups, up and down and up. Up and down the ladders too. It got tougher and tougher, but so did the men, which was the purpose of it all. And this time it was across the ladders. And once again, more classroom theory. Now with a 75 millimeter recoilless rifle. And with mortar fire direction center training. Then came the big push the last exercise they would go through before graduation. Its purpose, to put them through all the phases of combat. Fighting with artillery and tank support, actually attacking a hill position. The men of KMAG were watching them, and the general seemed satisfied with what he saw. What did Chang and his friends think of them as the shells burst and the bullets whistled around? They thought of the time when this was going to be the real thing. When up ahead was the live enemy with live ammo in their guns to put them to the test of all they had learned in the last 24 weeks. How to get there and stay alive. That's what they thought. They'd been training for this for weeks. Now they were ready. It was a taste of the real thing, 
and they could now face the enemy with confidence. The battle exercise over, Chang and the other candidates participated in OCS graduation exercise with the invocation first. With a band and all, and with speeches, of course. And they thought their salute was smart. This was the climax. This was what they had been working for all these months. And did that diploma make them proud? Now they were officers in the army of Korea. Now it was Lieutenant Chang Shiyuk, a leader of men. Later, when he gave his men orders, they obeyed without hesitation, because they knew he'd been trained to be a leader. Just as there were thousands of other officers and men who, like him, had been trained by KMAG. Tank. Artillery, infantry, signal corps, medics. It doesn't matter what branch they were in. They were an army now, a trained army of men who could be ready at any time to leap to the defense of their country. Yes, it was Lieutenant Chang Shiyuk. But at the same time, it was more than that. The splendid fighting youth of the Republic of Korea, looking ahead to a future of greatness, of happiness, and of peace. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us next week when the big picture will bring you another pictorial report on the activities of your army at home and abroad. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army. From Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Captain Carl Zimmerman. When we have troops stationed all over the world, as we have today, our army is faced with the tremendous task of keeping them supplied. This is the responsibility of one of the newest branches of the army, the Transportation Corps. Moving men and supplies with everything from a truck to a helicopter. Beaver 1, this is Beaver 3. Objective able taken. Ammo low. Reds are counterattacking. If we don't get more ammunition fast, they'll knock us off this rock. Roger, out. Ammunition consumed in battle. Chow. Good hot chow. Lots of it. Right up here every day. It never tasted better. Food and water consumed in battle. Baker Company's truck, sir. Red motor round caught it. Nobody hurt. The driver was up at the CP. Vehicles and equipment lost in battle. Hand me another case of plasma, Joe. The doc needs it quick. Blood lost in battle. The material of war used up, consumed in the struggle with the enemy. Men and their equipment, the prerequisite to victory. A never-ending river of supply, always flowing forward to the front. How it all gets there is the vital story of the Army's youngest service, the Transportation Corps. 
I can tell you part of that story. Before I wound up here in Korea, I was stationed at Fort Eustis, Virginia, the home of the Transportation Corps. It's a good post, lots of facilities for tough, realistic training. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Transportation was important long before there was a Transportation Corps in the Army or a Fort Eustis. Who was it? General Forrest, I think, back in the Civil War days, whose formula for winning battles was get there fastest with the mostest. It was a good rule then, and it works just as well today. Here at Fort Eustis, men are trained to take those words to heart. A part of this big job of getting stuff from where it is to where it's needed is the handling of cargo for shipment overseas. The Transportation Corps must ensure that American troops around the world will have enough and on time, for that is the motto of the Transportation Corps. Here at the third port training area at Fort Eustis, men learn how to handle cargo, how to stow all the thousands of different sizes and shapes that make up the equipment necessary for a modern army. Everything must be handled with care, because some guy on the other end may be betting his life on that radio or that crate of spare machine gun parts that's being loaded now. But stevedoring heavy cargo, important though it is, is only part of the story. If guys around the world are going to get it, the stuff has got to move, and people have got to get it going. Out of the sack, boy, up and at him. Fall out on the double. I can hear that sergeant still. I took this course myself. It was one of the best pieces of instruction I've ever received. After morning formation, these guys will be on their way to the B&O Railroad Yards in Baltimore, Maryland. Here, after preliminary training on the Transportation Corps' own railroad at Fort Eustis, they're going to learn practical railroading on one of the country's biggest lines. It's important because both here and abroad, railroads handle a huge amount of military supplies, and it'll be the job of these men to see that it is handled efficiently. Every soldier is assigned to a specific railroad employee for a 90-day period. At first, it's kind of tough. The old-timer's got his regular job to do, and you feel sort of like a third thumb. But you watch, and there's plenty to see. Then he gives you a little job to do, and you do it. Slowly, the ice begins to break, and after a while, you begin to know a little bit about each other. All the time, you're learning, and pretty soon, you're working as a team. at everything. The old timer is letting you do a lot of it by now. And just when you think you know everything about this railroad business, something new comes up and you start all over again. They're a great crew, these railroaders, and a lot of fast friendships grew up during our period of training here. Talk about cooperation, I've never seen a better example. The B&O is doing all this for just a dollar a year. The C&O is doing it too. The railroad brotherhoods are supporting the program. As for us, I can tell you we learned a lot. We learned by actually doing the job with equipment and facilities the Army could never hope to provide. Fort Eustis trains men to move material. One of the biggest jobs of moving material takes place at the various ports of embarkation around the zone of interior. New York, Hampton Roads, New Orleans, San Francisco and Seattle, all are ports of embarkation operated by the Transportation Corps. I'm a sergeant here at New York POE, Port of Embarkation. It is the largest of them all and handles most of the supplies going to the European Command, the Mediterranean and North Atlantic bases. Right now we are outloading diesel locomotives for shipment to help speed up transportation in Korea. From what I hear, the railway service is doing a big job over there, and they really need this equipment. You've got to be careful. Everything must be secure, because a locomotive lost at sea is just as useless as one that's never loaded. And when a ship starts tossing, it's easy to have cargo shipped 
if it isn't tied down nice and tight. Here at New York, civilian contractors do most of the work. But overseas, the Transportation Corps' own people will do the job. Everything secure and on its way. From Fort Eustis and the zone of the interior, men of the Transportation Corps move out to operations all around the world. Overseas, the Transportation Corps is responsible for all military rail and highway transportation. This includes operation of ports, railroads, trucks, barges, and other small freight ships. Actual ocean shipping is handled by the Military Sea Transportation Service of the Navy. Along with the primary mission of supply goes the secondary mission of training for possible future operations. If war should come to Europe, ports now being utilized might well be bombed and damaged beyond use. To prepare for such an emergency, the Transportation Corps practices supply over the beach operations. Since dawn yesterday, 13 ducks and 10 LCMs have been plowing back and forth through choppy waters between the old Oshkosh Victory, standing offshore, and the beach. Darn if it doesn't look like Normandy back in 44. This is a training operation, though, and it's been going on once a month, regular as clockwork for some time now. I'm a cargo checker here, and I can tell you they really push the stuff to us. Down the shore a little, they've got a dozer working, enlarging the area. This is the first thing you do. You've got to prepare the beach. And believe me, a bulldozer does a beautiful job of carving a traffic pattern out of these dunes. Vehicles can bog down pretty easily in soft sand. So the boys lay down a platform of interlocking steel mesh. Over a road like this, we can move the heaviest equipment without much trouble. About as easy as on a highway back home. While this is going on, the freighters drop anchor offshore. Gangs of soldier stevedores shuttle cargo into position down in the hold. Others sling steel lashes around the crates, while uh, one man stands ready to signal the winch operator. You know, you get kind of a kick when that first load swings up free and clear and over the side. Here it's dropped into either a duck, the Transportation Corps' amphibious truck, or into an LCM for the trip to shore. Ducks can carry a load right up the beach to discharge points, where it's sorted into various categories. LCMs have to be unloaded and the cargo placed in trucks for the trip over land. Supplies over the beach is a monthly training operation conducted along the western coast of France to ensure that the Transportation Corps will be able to move up men and material over the beach anywhere, anytime the need arises. At the discharge points, heavy-duty mobile cranes take over the job and unload the ducks and trucks. This cargo is part of the normal logistical support requirement of the European Command. Over 6,000 long tons of cargo, all helping to supply our troops over here. We're getting so good at this supply over the beach operation that we're offloading ships in the stream faster than ever before, while at the same time we learn the know-how of new techniques and improved equipment. Now it's the forklifts that tackle the material. They sort and separate the various loads so that they can be documented and loaded into rail cars for shipment to the various army depots throughout Europe. As the transportation car story unfolds, training gradually merges with actual operations until you're not sure where one ends and the other begins. The school at Fort Eustis, working on the B&O, 
Loading for overseas shipment at the New York port of embarkation, training operation supplies over the beach, and then Korea. You know, it's pretty much the same story over here. The number one port is Pusan. It's jammed to the hill all the time, so a lot of stuff has to be offloaded from ships in the stream. Here's where the ducks come in. For this sort of an operation, they're a natural. They can tote as much as five tons across open water, right up on the beach and further. Once here in Korea, a duck company carried supplies more than 50 miles inland to where they were needed, because they were needed in a hurry, and there wasn't either the time or the trucks to transship the stuff. Believe me, that unit was happy to see those ducks waddling down the road. They've been used in river crossings, too. The duck is a rugged little vehicle, but over here, you're lucky to find a road, and when you do, it's either ice or dust or mud, depending on the season. It's the railroad that has taken over the big job of supply, 75% of the UN load in some areas. This isn't the B&O, but a lot of the guys keeping this line going got their training from railroaders back home, and that experience is paying off right now. Although the highway system here is back in the horse and buggy days, the railroad is, or was before the invasion, pretty up to date. Track is standard gauge, road breads are well graded and ballasted, cuts and tunnels are reinforced, shops and yards are well equipped. It's the kind of line a railroad man likes to see. Funny thing about it all is that we've got the Japanese to thank for this road. They built it to provide a connecting rail service to their troops in China. Now it's on our side, and plenty important. The stuff comes in, and you move it up. Sounds easy, but it takes a pile of planning and coordination and sweat. And there's a lot of highly trained people working out this operation. It's a big job, almost as big as the fighting itself, because without this stuff, our guys couldn't fight. I remember when we were holed up down in the Pusan perimeter, we picked up an entire division and moved it 100 miles in less than 24 hours to meet a communist spearhead. And there's been lots of other times when this road has spelled the difference between defeat or victory. Its head of track is never very far from the front lines. Of course, all this big operation is not as easy as highball on the main line from New York to Philly. Because it's so important to the UN battle effort, the Reds have given the old line a rough going over. Whenever the battle swept south, bridges got blown, yards, shops, and rolling stock got wrecked. And then guerrilla bands still raid sections of the track or ambush special trains. It's not so bad now, but there was a time when those Jap-built steam locomotives had to pull their load with wooden pegs patching the bullet holes in their boilers. Now, however, most of the pulling job is done by U.S.-built diesel locomotives. Remember? We outloaded them at New York POE. They are Transportation Corps stock, run by TC men, sometimes with a Korean railroader along in the cab to act as pilot. But trains can't get everywhere, and where the railhead ends, the truck company takes over. A modern army needs fuel, lots of it diesel oil and gasoline to operate tanks and trucks and even the power generators that run communications equipment. Fuel is the lifeblood of battle, and it takes an ever-flowing river of it to keep this army in the field. It goes up in metal drums, thousands of them, and it's TC trucks and TC men that move it. It's rough going. Korea is a land of mountains. The roads are full of trick passes, blind curves, and washboard roadbeds. In the winter, they're ice and slush. In the spring and fall, mud. And in the summer, dust. Heavy, choking dust. You eat and breathe dust all along the hall from the loading point to the division dump.
Sometimes the Reds drop in a few artillery rounds to keep you jumping. And sometimes the guerrillas pull an ambush. Any way you look at it, it's a tough, dirty, double-clutching job. You're mighty glad to see the old Oasis sign. The Oasis is a halfway rest point, usually on top of a mountain, where both men and machines can call a halt for a few minutes after the long climb. Believe me, a cup of coffee or a canteen of cool water is like a gift from heaven. And then you're off again, delivering the goods to the guys who'll know how to use them best. And so it goes in Korea. Up and down the peninsula, back and forth between the front lines and the port, the men of the Transportation Corps move the river of supplies forward. The river that must never stop or even falter once. For without it, the battle effort of our army withers up and dies. Military transportation is as old as human history, but there are always new wrinkles. We tried out one of the newest methods at an infantry maneuver at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I remember the battalion moved out at dawn against light aggressor resistance. We thought it was going to be a picnic. But by 11 o'clock, the umpires ruled that we were pinned down good. It seems that we needed light artillery and replacements to finish the maneuver. I wasn't very happy because I knew the kind of terrain we'd been over. Nothing but a foot soldier could make it. And it had taken us six hours to get here. I watched the old man put in a call. It seemed like I'd been waiting there for days. Actually, I guess it was under an hour when I heard the sound of engines overhead. What do you know? Helicopters. Lots of them floating in over our rear. What I want most in the world right now is maybe some jets coming in for a simulated airstrike. Or that beautiful rustle of artillery on the wing. Aggressor bound. I'd even settle for a few fresh faces coming out of the woods behind me. Anything to get this maneuver over. And what do I get? Egg beaters. What can a guy get from egg beaters? And then I found out. People. Our guys. A whole company of them. They moved in fast right behind us. They kept on coming. It was good to have them. Then the big surprise came. 75 millimeter howitzers, a whole battery. And ammunition. We were a fighting force again. The 75s opened up. It was music. We moved out and the aggressor fell back before our increased firepower. It wasn't long before the objective was taken, thanks to fast, close helicopter support. Another training exercise was over. Another training exercise, yes. But the first to ever employ the TC's new transportation helicopter company in simulated action. A new dimension has been added to the problem of frontline support to fighting troops. This transportation helicopter company, the predecessor of many yet to come, had proven its value to the Army and to the fighting soldier in particular.
But if your transportation corps is to stay on top in this big business of supplying a worldwide army, there must be constant research and development. Big, huh? That wheel is almost 10 feet high. It is one of four that drive the transportation car's new amphibious vehicle. The Bark, 60 tons of versatile cargo transportation, on land or in the water. I'm one of the assistant project officers from the transportation car's research and development station. And I've been working on the development of this vehicle since its conception. We started out with a box, not just any box, mind you, but a box just the right size, big enough to accommodate more than 600 items of the type normally brought ashore in any amphibious operation. Equipment and supplies which the duck cannot carry, such as tanks, trucks, and cranes. Then we got ourselves four tires, the biggest we could find. And we got four diesel engines, one to drive each wheel enough to apply 30 tons of turning force to each of the four wheels. It takes a lot to bog down this baby. Then we wrap the whole thing up in a steel shell with enough buoyancy to float 100 tons of equipment. That means the bark can load its heavy cargo from a ship offshore, cross a prepared beach, and land at points well inland at the enemy's front door. And nobody gets their feet wet. We're pretty pleased with it. Of course, all this wasn't so easy. A lot of skilled people, both military and civilian, spent a lot of time figuring out all the complex problems created by the construction of such a huge vehicle. But thanks to them, the Bark is expected to be one of the most useful pieces of equipment ever made. Here, it prepares to make a landing on Puget Sound. It is carrying a medium tank, 35 tons, and a mobile crane, 35 tons, 70 tons in all. A nice normal load for the bark. Up and over she goes. Tires are deflated, some for better traction in soft sand up and over inland. Look at her maneuver. Each wheel is steered separately so she can get around in tight places. From his perch in the cab, the driver picks his spot. Seconds later, the tank is earthbound and heading for a fight. In just minutes, the 35-ton all-purpose crane is on its way, and we are in business. What a vehicle, that bark. You bet, it's quite a vehicle. It's the most recent chapter in the story of your Army's Transportation Corps. The whole story is one of delivering the goods so that the man of the front may never lack the stuff with which to do battle. That's the Transportation Corps, whose men merit the reputation for accomplishment as the Army's versatile mover of men and materiel. Wherever you find American troops today, you find the men of the TC, the Transportation Corps. Next week, we'll take you to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to meet the troopers of the All-American Division, the 82nd Airborne. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center.
presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.